Here's something from my fellow passive knitters. I feel that I've neglected you a little bit lately, and the reason is my machine was too stiff to run. But after a good deep soaking, we're back in business and we'll make this hat today. I've heard from several people recently who had done what they thought was a good cleaning job, and I've had this happen myself, and the machine still wasn't running beautifully. So Jack made this video while he was cleaning up behind me. And you may find that it helps you too if you're having trouble getting your passive fully back to work. So I'll put a link to this one in the program notes. Assuming your machine is ready to knit beautifully, we'll knit this hat together. It's really basic, but it does have ribbing. Because one of the great things about a passive is that you don't have to get out a ribber and attach it and adjust it. It's there, it's integral, it's part of the operation, and it's no extra trouble to make ribbing. We will do a gathered crown like this one, very simple. This hat will finish to 20 inches in circumference. That's a small adult, or most women, lots of big kids, hardly any extra large men. I will put other sizes in a written pattern and offer it to Country Knitting of Maine News and Views. I'm using three strands of 224 weight industrial yarn run together to create the equivalent of one strand of sport weight. This is getting six stitches, nine rows per inch at stitch size seven using the end setting. Same stitch size works for both beds for me. For experienced knitters, this on this screen is really all you need. We're going to cast on 120 stitches knit for 16 rows and one by one ribbing, then 60 plain stock in it rows, then gather off. The edges of the work will be seamed together and that will make the hat. Now, for those of you who need a little more help, stick around and we'll knit it together. We're using a span of 120 needles, but every other one is in work on the back bed and every other one is in work on the front bed. Both beds are set to N and both are set to stitch size two. It's traditional to go even lower for your zigzag row, but two works best for me on this particular machine. We're using orange strippers. The one on the right is actually red, but it still counts as orange, and those are what we always select for double bed work. Follow the passive needle rule, which means that on the front bed is the leftmost stitch in work, and on the back bed, is the rightmost stitch in work, and make sure that you do use your edge clips. It makes a world of difference. The next two rows will be circular rows, so set both locks to CX, and I go up a stitch size for these two rows. Each machine has its own personality. You may or may not need to go up a stitch size, but it works best for me. So when we knit the two circular rows, that initial zigzag row will be locked in, the stitches cannot run, and we're ready to go back to in and actually knit the ribbing. Typically, we select two or three whole numbers smaller than the main stockinette stitch size for the ribbing stitch size. So here I used number five and it worked out well and knit for 16 rows. Generally, these four rows all count as the cast on. Zigzag row, two tubular rows at the CX, CX setting, and then one final row closing that all up. Then count 16 rows of ribbing after that. It's not critical. It's just how we usually do it. I have been knitting up to now without any weight because many passive knitters don't own any weights. Passive will knit without them, but you will find it easier to transfer the stitches if you use some. So I've hung my heavy forks from the Cool Tools and Cheap Tricks book on the edges, and you can see how the edge stitches are pulling downward as compared to the others. This downward pull is going to make the next step where we transfer all of the front bed stitches to the back bed much easier to accomplish without dropping any stitches. So passive knitters, if you don't have any weights and you're basically fine with that, you may want to at least buy some claw weights or look into making your own as per Cheap Tricks and Cool Tools. To move stitches from bed to bed, we typically pick one up with the double eye tool using one of the eyelets, 
twist the tool so the stitch slides towards the other bed and hang it on the opposing needle. If you don't have the double line needle, you can buy one intended for any standard gauge machine, or you can substitute a dental pick type tool. Here I'm actually using a loom pick that's been a little bit sharpened to fit better on a passive machine to pick up the stitches from the front bed and hold them on the tool until I can bring forward a needle on the back bed. Both work well. The double eye needle is more secure against droppage, but you may want to have both tools handy because they use the hand in different ways and if you get tired from one, you can shift to the other. From now on, we will only be knitting on the back bed. We're treating it as though it were the main bed of a Japanese machine and it will do the stock and net knitting so it will be set on N. Technically, we don't have to change the settings on the front bed because with all the needles out of work, it shouldn't do anything. But just to be safe, change to GX and then we know it will behave. We're doing single bed work now, so change to black strippers. And knit 60 plain stock and net rows with the back bed set on end. That's all there is to it. But I will add a couple of finer points because I know that most experienced knitters won't need this hat pattern. Those of you watching are largely kind of new to pass-ups. So, first thing to keep in mind is that this little trigger is positioned so that it does tell the row counter to count off numbers. And it can be best to put it a little bit inside the extreme edges of the needle design. It's on the front bed. It's not going to be in your way. Anchor it with one of the edge springs, and that way you'll make sure that it counts every time you pass the end needle that is in work on the back bit. Second, do use your edge springs to hold the end working needle down with the latch closed. They are specifically what pass it made to keep stockinette stitches from dropping off the end needle using the end setting. Next, don't try to knit too fast. That's not a passive thing. And do be sure the entire lock assembly passes the end needle every pass of the whole assembly. It's easy to turn too quickly and it causes a clunk and a jam. If you're just knitting one hat today, either scrap off or use the yarn tail to gather off all the stitches and you're done. If you would like to knit a strip of hats, which is what I want to do because I'm trying to catch up on my charity knitting, and I will tell you more about that at the end of the movie, cut the yarn leaving a long tail, drop the tail down between the beds, change to another color of yarn for waist yarn, and knit a few rows, and we will be able to begin again and save some time. Even though we're going to do a closed cast on, using the tubular cast on, and that's easy on the passive. It's easier still when there's knitting already on there. So leaving the waist yarn and the previous hat will speed it up a little bit. But those are my waist yarn rows completed. Of course, my waist yarn was just in stockinette. I was still in, in on the back bed only. So I need to get back to ribbon configuration by transferring every other stitch of the waist yarn onto the front bed. Again, remembering the needle rule, last needle on the left should be on the front, last needle on the right should be on the back. We're returning to double bed work, so we return to orange strippers. We're returning to the cast on stitch size, so for me that's number two. Then it will be three, three while I do my CX rows, and then five, five for the ribbing. So basically we're gonna repeat everything we did except there will be waist yarn and another hat down below the one we're working on. We can repeat as many times as we desire and make as many hats in one strip as we want. I didn't use ravel cord between the segments. I will show you an alternate way of getting the waist yarn separate from the main yarn for this video, but if you want to use ravel cord, you certainly may. Before separating the hats from each other, Thread your yarn tail into a yarn needle and work it all the way through the final row of the first half. Be sure to catch every stitch 
In this picture, the second hat begins here. Here's the waist yarn that we knitted between the two hats. And here's where the yarn tail is worked in and out through every stitch of the final row of the first hat. I just used a running stitch and all we're doing is creating a gathering thread to gather in the top of the crown. Once that's done, if you used Ravel Cord, you can pull it out now. If you did not, snip the row of waist yarn in one or more places where it adjoins the main yarn. That's the row that has the gathering thread worked through it, which we won't pull tightly yet. And you can see that the waist yarn will separate. We're just treating the final row of waist as though it were a ravel cord. And it has to be snipped more than once sometimes because it's not as slippery, but it works nicely. Here you can see quite clearly that the stitches are being held on the gathering thread, though we haven't gathered it in yet. Once the first hat is free, begin gathering from one end. Be careful that you don't snatch too hard and break the cord. Gather it in as tightly as possible, stitch across, and use the remainder of the yarn tail to seam the two edges together, and the hat will be complete. Just as is true of almost all machine knitted ribbing, this ribbing will assume its eventual shape and look nicest if you pull it lengthwise. Now let's talk for a moment about charity knitting. I think it's a great thing for a number of reasons, and one of them is to, it benefits us, the knitters. We get to practice, without much pressure, all kinds of skills, and the humblest of hats will keep somebody warm. The person who needs a hat is not inclined to criticize that it's plain, or they don't just love the color, or you made a teensy-weensy mistake. Now, my husband wears a lot of hats, but he still only has one head. I could not practice every technique that I wanted to learn and supply him with a useful hat. So somebody else will benefit from some of these when I'm polishing my skills, and that's a good thing. And while I know we can't alleviate all the suffering and poverty in the world, it still feels good to do what we can and provide warm things for people who can't provide them for themselves. And there are a lot of good, reliable charities that will accept hats and distribute them to those in need. My favorite is the Keeping Maine Warm campaign. It's run by Linda Williams, who publishes the magazine that I write for. It's in Maine, and she distributes locally in Maine to all sorts of places that serve people in need. There is zero overhead. It's handled on a volunteer basis, so every hat goes somewhere that it's needed, and I feel good about that. So I will put a link to the Keeping Maine Warm information in the program notes in case this interests you too. Oh, and before I forget, this is all tied to a contest, so those who donate hats may also win prizes.